Hello, all. Welcome. And I know we're going to have other people coming in in the next few minutes because we had quite a bit of a, a turnout for the people wanting this, which I am very happy. Um, this is called the Judy Brooks series, named after a very active uh, community person as well as very active league member, Judy Harris Brooks. And uh, we lost her in 2018, but she's always with many of us in our hearts and minds. Um, she will be remembered as an educator and very much a civic leader who got involved in so many things um, from 35 years of teaching um, and to um, being involved with the League of Women Voters, the ABC House. They, she and Barry were uh, parents, were the, one of the first ones in this area and um, was a former member of the select board as well as the Democratic and National Conventions. So we named, with the permission of her family, we named the series after her because of her activity in the town and in the league. And I'm very, very pleased and proud to present our two guests uh, who are part of uh, the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. I am so proud that I can say that off the top of my head now. I'm terrible with <laughs> um, which is extremely important. It is the sequel, I'd like to say, to the Community Safety Working Group, which was a bunch of, including uh, Deborah, where, where it was a bunch of very hardworking people who went up against so much and they got us uh, to have crest. They got us to, I mean, they got us to actually move in a really good direction. Between that and the reparations committee, I think we may have a chance if we keep pushing and moving. Um, Allegra Clark is, wave, <laughs> is a social worker with experience working with trauma, substance use, and homelessness on an individual and systemic, systemic level. The, her current work in the court system offers a window into the racial disparities in the system and her professional experience informs her work in the community advocating for anti-racist public safety alternatives, proactive approaches to addressing community needs, needs rather. And she's very, very involved and she is, one, she is the co-chair of the CSSJC. Um, and Deborah, I've had to like read this three times because she's such a phenomenal person who has done so many things. Um, she is originally born in Cape Verde, who some of us would like to be going to in West Africa, and um, came up in Bedford, Massachusetts. She's an attorney, but she's also a poet, and she's very much a community organizer, civil rights investigator, administrator, and educator. Um, she has... Um, two sons, and um, they are incredible already. The 20-year-old is a, is, a, is a college student, and the 14-year-old, I can't believe he's 14, uh, because I've known him since he was born, and that's one of the few I've seen grow up. Uh, her involvement in the community is so, so clear to all of us, and the role she takes on between mother, between attorney, between just community member, uh, she works at UMass Amherst, uh, and she has for 21 years as an associate counsel, counsel for the Office of counsel, uh, General Counsel. And I'm not going to go on and on. She has done so many things. Um, she gives back to the community in so many ways, and she's the organizer for the, her late husband, Julius Ford, the Harriet Tubman Healthy Living Community organization, intergenerational, evolving learning community that works together with youth of color and other marginalized youths in the greater Pioneer Valley to foster social justice, again, always, and vibrant communities. And um, I'm going to stop there by saying she is the other co-leader uh, uh, of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. So um, without further ado, I give you the two of them. If you all would uh, put, make sure you keep your um, things on mute so that, you know, <laughs> so that they can be heard. And there will be questions and answer when they're finished, okay? So I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. It's up to you. All right, Allegra, do you wanna put on the... Uh...
But in the meantime, while we're waiting to put our PowerPoint up, why don't I get started just with kind of a further introduction. I want to obviously thank you all for inviting us. Um, this is incredible. I knew Judy Brooks and she uh, was and will always be a phenomenal woman. Um, you know, she was a mentor, someone that I looked up to, a role model in this community. Her activism uh, was just, um, you know, powerful. And so I'm just so um, honored and humbled to have been asked to present uh, for this series, which obviously uh, means so uh, dear to me and obviously her husband to Mr. Brooks, who we just lost also. I mean, they're just a phenomenal family. So thank you so much. And of course, I wanna thank uh, the League of Women uh, Voters as well as uh, racial uh, justice, uh, racial uh, equity, right? Uh, committee um, for inviting us. Uh, thank you so much. Oops, <laughs> the Racial Justice Committee. Yes. Oh, Racial Justice. Right. Oh, I was right yes. then. With the we first are part one. of the league. Okay. And I'm sorry, <laughs> Racial Justice people. I completely left us out. <laughs> oh, okay. Perfect. We're the ones who do this. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Um, so, you know, just a little bit in terms of just to kind of uh, say, you know, obviously in terms of the work that I do, um, for me, social justice, diversity, equity, inclusion is just a part of my life, right? Being an immigrant to this country um, and then um, having gone to UMass, my undergrad, and then, you know, becoming an attorney afterwards by going to, to BC, Boston College Law School, and then coming back to this community, community after being away for 10 years um, and, you know, raising my children here. So my kids have gone through the um, school system here in Amherst, and, and I still have a 14-year-old who's in eighth grade right now. So Amherst is very dear to me in terms of where I live and where my children are growing up. And so for me, one of the reasons why I um, took part in the Community Safety Working Group um, at CSWG and then decided to be part of CSSJT, CSSJC, which is a group that is the one that's maintaining and making sure that the recommendations here at WG are put in place is because of what transpired after uh, George Floyd was murdered. Um, for me as a black woman, unfortunately it wasn't the first time that um, we've seen a gruesome you know, murder of uh, a black man in this country um, by the police, but it was the first time that it was caught on video in that way and that people were able to see. And I never will forget my, um, he was then 10 years old, my youngest son, seeing just a glimpse because I knew he couldn't see the whole thing, right? So he only saw a glimpse and him just breaking down in tears, right? Because he's a black boy. And he could see that obviously if this man could go through what he went through and then his life being um, taken away from him, then he could all, that could also happen to him. And so for me as a mother, as a black woman, um, it was very impactful to me, right? That my sons, I have a 20 year old who's in college in New York. And so for me, I'm always afraid, right? Of what could happen. And so when, when all of that happened, I know there was a lot of protests and of course I took part in the protests, but then there was this opportunity where someone nominated me to apply to be part of CSWG. Um, and, and for me, I was just like, I need to do something and I wanna do something that's more long-term because I want not only my kids, but all kids, all young people and all people within Amherst who are BIPOC, who are the ones who are marginalized and voiceless to have a, a voice in this community and to feel safe in this community, which is very key to me, right? And to be able to be who you are to be able to be fully yourself in terms of your identity. And that's always been you know, part of, of who I am and, and the work that I do. So, um, so for me, that's where it began. And I've continued to do that. And I will continue to do that because it's, it's very important that I not um, shy away from this type of work, even though it's very tiresome, even though there's days that I say, I don't wanna do it anymore. And it's very <laughs> stressful. Um, and it's very hard, um, but this is why I do it and I will continue to do so. So I'll stop there and, and let Allegra um, talk a little bit why she, she does this work. Thank you, Deborah. And again, thank you to the League for having us. It's really important to share the work that we've been doing with you know the broader community. So I really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to do so. Um, so I graduated from high school in Amherst in 2003. And during my time 
in high school. It, the world changed a lot. We had 9-11. We had the two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq begin. And we had a lot of racialized violence in the school. Um, and I did join a, I guess we called ourselves a social justice theater troupe at the time. And we were really exploring our own identities through spoken word and um, dance and other performing arts. So that was kind of, you know, one aspect of being involved in social justice work. But my first real experience happened in the summer of 2004. I had an internship with Tapestry Health um, doing work in their substance use program. And it was a harm reduction based program in Springfield. And at the time, you know, people with opiate disorders were not um, not treated as kindly and compassionately as they are now. And I would beg that that's not even very kind and compassionate today. But I was working with a specific population of Latino injection drug users um, at a time when we didn't have access to some of the programs that we had today. And I believe that it was a direct result of racial disparities in health care services and that Tapestry was doing the best it could to provide culturally sensitive care to this population. Um, so that experience stuck with me in, in all of the professional experiences I had afterwards and really shaped my desire to become a social worker. Um, I've worked in the jails and in the court system and in juvenile justice. And I think one incident that really sticks out and really made me want to continue to advocate for a more just system is I remember sitting in court in Boston one day and there was a black man and a white woman who were both charged with the same crime. The white woman was sitting in the audience and the black man was in custody. So he was locked up for the same crime. The judge is talking to the white woman about oh, you can do community service. I hope you have a great experience. And it was all this, you know, hand-holding and like, we're going to rehabilitate you. And the same crime, you see the treatment of the Black man so different. You know, he's being held on bail and being taken back down to the lockup. And it just, it really bothered me that there was such disparate treatment. So after George Floyd was murdered, um, I was, I've been working in the courts in Holyoke and Palmer, and I formed an alliance with some members on my team to kind of push for more racial awareness in the work that we do, and really being more anti-racist with our lens in terms of how we're evaluating both the people that we're working with and the situations that they're in. Um, so once the CSWG had formed, I really followed what they were doing, and because I had been advocating for reallocation of funding from police to more you know, service-based opportunities for people. Once CSWG had put forward their plan of services, it seemed like that would make perfect sense for some funding to be reallocated to reduce the impact of policing on our BIPOC community here in Amherst and hopefully provide some services both for youth and for the general population so that there's prevention and avoidance of the legal system in the first place. So once the CSSJC was formed, I felt like that would be a good place for me to join and put some of my efforts forward. So I joined when we started in 2022 and um, was the co-chair with Dr. Shabazz um, up until she resigned. And then Deborah has graciously stepped into her place and has been a wonderful co-chair. So I'm, I'm grateful to have such strong leaders to do this work with. Okay, are you uh, are you guys ready to do the PowerPoint? Or yeah, yes. Can you gonna, see it? Well, yeah, we can see it. Okay. Um, yes. You can, um, you can go to the first slide. Yeah. All right. Can you see it, Allegra? Yes. Oh, very clear. All right. 
All right, so I'm going to get us started and then um, Allegra will take us through some other of the slides. Um, so, you know, we have the Community Safety and Social Justice um, Committee, which is CSSJC that was form formed in June 2022, and it's a successor group to the Community Safety Working Group. Um, and as we've stated, CSWG was um, begun because of the George Floyd uh, murder um, in November 2020, actually, is when we began our, our work. And um, really, we were focusing on recommending alternatives to policing and how to also change um, the town and its safety services uh, to make sure that it's more equitable. Um, but one of the things that really was um, driving us, right, is that during that time, as we know, when George Floyd was murdered, there were so many organizations, so many municipalities that basically started uh, making these statements and, and really um, Stating, make, stating that they were going to work on equity and, and, and deal with discrimination and racism and so on and so forth. And so for us too, we knew that a lot of this would come about, right? That people would feel guilty and feel that they um, had to say something because of the atrocity that happened to George Floyd. Um, and so we also knew that there was a small window period of time to really get this work done. Because as we're seeing now, right, four years later, uh, um, a lot of the rolling back, a lot of, oh, we didn't actually promise that. Oh, we didn't say that. And now it's rolling back of what people had and organizations and municipalities had stated they were going to do after George Floyd was murdered around ending racism, discrimination, around social justice, equity. Now it's the taking it back, right? And so I want to remind us of the resolution that town of Amherst made, right? So a resolution affirming um, that uh, commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity for black residents uh, in, in, in stating that, uh, that it affirms its commitment to eradicating effects of systemically racist practices of town government and town affiliated organizations and will review and revise its policies, procedures, bylaws, values, goals, and missions through an anti-racism lens to foster an unbiased and inclusive environment that is free of discrimination, harassment, and negative stereotyping towards any person or group. So I think we wanna sit with that, right? Because that was one of our guiding forces in terms of the work that CSWG began with, right? In terms of making these recommendations. Because for me, why I joined CSWG was because, and I, when I, when I was interviewed for it, and I remember Paul Bachman was um, uh, there and others who were interviewing me in terms of, of my, my possible participation in CSWG, I was very clear that I was not gonna take part in any group that wasn't real, that wasn't going to do the work, right? And so with this resolution, if this is what the town of Amherst is saying that they're going to do, I'm going to hold the town accountable, right? You're not going to say that just to say that. You're not just gonna talk the talk and not walk the walk. And so for me and others on CSWG and now CSSJC, we are telling the town to walk the walk. You're not just gonna say things and, and, and let it be meaningless. That's not what we're about. So can we go to the next slide, please? So I'm going to go and talk about CSWG, right? Because I was one of the members and you can see here that there were other members. Um, and I'm going to talk about the recommendations. But first and foremost, of course, I want to talk about all of the members. So we had Brianna Owen, who was one of our co-chairs, and Alicia Walker, who's our, our town counselor, who I'm very excited about. She's, you know, a brave, courageous, just wonderful person on our town council who really, you know, speaks and gives a voice to the voiceless. Um, and then we had Tashina Bowman, Darius Cage, who was our, our uh, younger person on, on our group and brought so much in terms of the youth voice on our committee, on our working group. And then myself, we had Miss Pat Unanibaku, who is a force and a beacon and just an all around, um, you know, incredible person who brought so much uh, leadership and guidance to our group. Russ Vernon Jones, who you, I know you all know him. He was a former principal and you know just a wealth of information. And then uh, Jennifer Moyson, who was our staff liaison. And 
Before that, Paul Wiley was also part of um, our group. He was our co-chair, but then he resigned a couple months later. And Paul also was a former um, uh, principal and obviously brought a, a wealth of information. What I want to say about this group of people is that they're one of the most incredible group of people that I've ever worked with. Um, they were focused. They were diligent. We met for almost a year on a weekly basis for a number of hours and did work throughout the month to make sure that we would get these uh, recommendations out and get our charge completed because we had two parts to our charge, which I'm going to go into. So it was just incredible that we were able to get that much work done um, in that span of time. But it was that important for us to get this, this work done for all those reasons that Allegra and I have already stated in, in our intro. So um, overview of community safety working group recommendations. Um, so part A was, was focused on alternative, for us to come up with alternatives um, to policing, right? Um, and we, you know, uh, looked at different programs. We looked at, you know, websites. We looked at different municipalities. We hired a consulting group, a seventh generation consulting group that was led by Dr. D. Shabazz, uh, who was just incredible. Um, and her team of people who did just uh, wonderful research and brought us the data that we needed and went into community and got information um, in a way that was um, just respectful um, and, and valuable. And during a time when the pandemic was raging, right? In the middle of that, they were able to go and, and, and talk to the people that usually don't, you know, and I have to say it, won't be at a meeting like this, right? Because they either don't speak, um, uh, uh, you know, English is not the first language. They don't have access to, to a computer to be able to get online but they went out there and got folks to talk to them, to be able to share uh, what would be a program that would be an alternative to policing that uh, would be a benefit um, to the town, right? And so we were able to get a lot of this valuable knowledge and what were their perspectives, you know, you know, in regards to the police too, which was something that, that was important. And what would be some of the other programs that possibly would be able to really um, allow people to have a full life, to have a beneficial life, to be able to be a full, um, uh, um, you know, resident and person within Amherst and, and be someone that does not look just in, in a certain income level or a certain race, right? That looks like me, that looks like anyone else and, and who is BIPOC or disabled or different sexual orientation or religion or what have you. Right, so we want to make sure that everyone was included in terms of when we were looking at these recommendations. So the first recommendations that, that we did make was around creating uh, the community response for equity, safety, and and um, service, the CREST program, which you all know is the community responder program. And we're going to be talking a lot more about about CREST because this is one of the kind of um, you know Amherst was a leader. Not, not only in the town, but in Massachusetts. This was one of the first programs of its kind that was created. So an unarmed uh, alternative to policing, but it's a public safety uh, program is what we envisioned, right? Um, to deal with a plethora of issues that were not Non that were non-violent, right? So it could be trespass, um, you know, um, homelessness, mental health issues, um, you know, alcohol, drug abuse, um, noise complaints, anything um, non-violent. We visioned this group, uh, you know, dealing with it and and following up on it. Not being a social service agency, but being a a, a place where they could. Um, get the first kind of contact and then liaise with other programs and resources to be able to get um, people the, the help that they needed, right? But to be, an, um, to be a group that was anti-racist, focused on social justice, de-escalation, and making sure that you're actually having a human contact as opposed to a lot of what was happening in terms of what we had heard from the community with the police, which is a lot of times fear, intimidation, feeling like 
you, you don't have a say in terms of how to interact with the person that's needing assistance, right? And so Crest was critical, but one of the main things was that Crest had, had to be autonomous, not be part of the police, not be part of any public uh, safety agency, not the fire department or anything, be independent and have their own space, right? But be a part of you know the town and be paid by the town, but be um, separate. And also for them to get dispatch, um, calls, so 911 calls, so to have calls, not only that people can call to their own number, but also have dispatch, um, send them uh, calls when they come in. And so, um, and we're going to talk more about Crest, but as you all, or some of you know, there's been, it, it, there's been some highlights, but there's also been some issues. And right now, for instance, there's a, a, a search for a new director um, that's undergoing. So, Crest is going to be key for us to stabilize, for us to, to strengthen and make sure that it, it continues to move forward. Um, but like I said, we'll, we'll talk more about Crest uh, in, in some later slides. Um, the other uh, uh, recommendations also included the Amherst Resident Oversight Board, or Rob. Uh, and I'm gonna talk to you about kind of the status of where things are at in, in regards to this, right? So with the Resident Oversight Board, as of right now, we still don't have a Resident Oversight Board. And mind you, we put we made these recommendations back in, in, in 2021, all right? And now we're in 2024, there's still no resident oversight board, which is a board where people can go to file complaints relevant to the uh, uh, Amherst Police Department. But also we, we even envisioned it for Crest too, right? So any complaints, you could go there in terms of, of, of public safety, you could go to this resident oversight board and have this in, independent board be able to um, look and, and, and investigate and then be able to provide and recommend discipline at the end and, and to make sure that these public safety agencies were being held accountable. So the resident oversight board is something that is key. I know that right now what the town has done is they've hired a consultant to uh, put, to, put together hearings um, and do a survey to, to hear from the community. But for, for us at CSSJC and CSWG, we, CSWG, we had already done the work. We already had gathered the data through seventh generation, uh, which stated that this was necessary. And we already had an outline based on research that we had done in terms of what the resident oversight board could look like. So we really didn't think that this step was, was necessary, that we could go right to implementation, but the town felt that, okay, you know, now we need to go through these hearings. So um, all I can say is that you know, there's there's still some other ones. I think there's some coming up on Sunday. It, please participate in it because it seems like the step has to be taken, it has to be uh, uh, done in order for this resident oversight board to, to take place. But we know that this needs to take place because people do not feel safe to complain about the police unless they have an independent board in order to do so. And Deborah, if I can just add, I believe there is a session occurring right now as well. Um, so sadly, we're in conflict with that. But I, I did hear from the consultant that they have received, I think, 45 survey responses. Um, so people yeah. are filling it out. It is it is still available, I believe, to be filled out. So, Hi, Lord. Can, um, I was a part of that meeting. It, it's our, um, ended, but okay. it did happen earlier today. Um, and there were a few people there and they have 46 right now. And there's another one on Sunday. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and, and from what I've heard is that, you know, obviously people feel more comfortable, um, you know, kind of submitting the surveys yes. um, as opposed to even, you know, going to the, to the actual hearings because, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to, to come out and talk about your feelings around the police because you're afraid of intimidation and harassment. So, um, and that's why, again, we are so thankful to 7th Gen because of how they did it in terms of anonymity and being able to go and talk to, to people and people felt comfortable talking with them about what was happening. Um, and then, you know, the other uh, recommendation that we made was the, the diversity, equity, inclusion department, the DEI department. Um, and that this was created, again, we wanted it well-staffed and well-funded, but there's only two people uh, right now. And actually one of the people who's a director, Pamela Young, she was tapped to now do this temporary leadership. She leads a temporary leadership team that's, uh, um, you know, 
leading Crest right now. So she's not even doing her job. She's doing the Crest job right now, which obviously, you know, at CSSJC, we did not think that that was a good idea. Um, and so diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is led by Pamela Young and, and uh, Jennifer Moyston, but they are understaffed. They don't have enough funding. Um, they're a, they're, they've done some programming and things like that, but there's a lot more to do and they need a lot more funding and staff, staff, um, uh, uh, staff positions in order to do what they need to do, all right, and to do it well. And then um, the other... Uh, recommendations. One was to create a BIPOC-led Amherst Youth Empowerment Center and an Amherst BIPOC Cultural Center. And so for all of the, for both of these was for the Youth um, Empowerment Center to have a space for youth, because we know in this time we don't have a dedicated space for, for youth, and uh, an empowerment center that would be BIPOC youth-led, right, to give uh, BIPOC youth that, that space for um, leadership and to, to be able to guide and lead. Um, we do have right now the town through DI, I, I'm starting to do a little bit of programming or, or, or trying to figure out, um, you know, how to in terms of this youth empowerment center, but as of as of currently there's there's still no plans in terms of putting a youth empowerment center in place and this is something that CSSJC and the recommendation that CSWG had made. And then the Amherst BIPOC Cultural Center, the same, the same thing, a BIPOC Cultural Center that would be open to all, but it would be a cultural center for all different cultures, right? To be able to have a space, to be able to have events, and to also to have, um, you know, resources for families, right, that are going through different aspects in their lives or needs in their lives, and to have that resource there to be able to help families as they're going through whatever you know, issues or, or, or concerns that they're going through through their life, they have that support. And for the youth too, right? They have that support in terms of their youth empowerment after school so that they have a, a safe place to be able to kind of go through the developmental kind of issues that youth go through and to have a, a safe pl place to go to, to, to do that, right? And so none of these ha have um, had any real funding put towards them and no, no center. So that's something that CSSGC has been, you know, talking about when we meet on a monthly basis and really monitoring very closely. And then the other um, recommendation was in terms of reducing the size of the Amherst Police Department, because in our way of looking at things, if you put Crest in place, a resident oversight board, you have a DEI department that's fully staffed and doing the work in terms of really holding the town account accountable to being anti-racist and being inclusive and about social justice. And also, if you have a BIPOC-led Amherst Youth Empowerment and BIPOC Cultural Center, then you're going to, you're not going to need um, as big a Amherst Police Department, right? That could be, actually be shrunk because they'll be dealing only with violent um, types of interactions. Um, and so we did not say to fire anyone or to terminate anyone, anything like that. It was just reduce the size based on on natural attrition, right? If someone retires, if someone leaves, don't hire. A, a new police officer. That also hasn't been followed because there has been other hires since we made that recommendation in 2021. There has been more hires in the police department. So that's something that we're going to continue to, to monitor. And then, um, you know, at that time we had said to keep the community safety working group in place um, because we were a working group, but to change this into a committee because since we were doing such, um, you know, uh, important work. We wanted to continue to do this important work and make sure that these recommendations were put in place. But at, at the time, um, you know, Paul Bachman decided to, to dismantle us. And so we then, as part B, if we can go to part B, Allegra, so then we basically um, asked if there could be a creation of an ongoing committee. And this is how CSSJC was born, right? Because we created a charge and 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 that's how CSSJC was came out of, of, of being a standing committee. So with CSSJC, as you all know, we meet on a monthly basis. We are the ones that are monitoring and making sure that these recommendations are put in place. We're also an advisory group, right? To advise the town council, the town manager, um, uh, town offices around e e issues of, of social justice, equity, inclusion, but we don't get utilized like that. We all, a lot of times we get told after the fact, or we get just some updates. And so that's something that we're, we've been talking to the town, please utilize this, right? 
we are the ones that, you know, have done this type of work for many years in our lives. We're the ones with lived experience. Utilize this, right? You know that they went through the whole July 5th incident where young people were told they had no rights. And we know that that was a situation that was very tense, that could have been handled differently. And we asked them time and time again to, you know, you use us because we're the ones that, that are connected to the community so that we could, you know, be able to uh, interact and really make sure that the young people and the families felt respected and would get some resolution, but that didn't happen, all right? Um, and so we're saying that, you know, this is something that needs to continue, this, this relationship needs to continue to uh, be fostered so that, you know, the town understands that, listen, we're here to assist. We're here as partners, not, it's not an us, versus them. It's us, us working together for a better Amherst. And that's you know our message. Um, so for the part B, it was really to look at possible reform, reforms to the police department, looking at the policies and procedures. And so we made a, a plethora of, of uh, recommendations. Again, we, we restated the resident oversight board and went into more specifics around that. And if I would say anything too, is like, please go to the community safety working group uh, webs, um, webpage uh, in the town and just look at our reports. It, they are so succinct. They put, we put so much information into that. It's very clear. And you all will get so much information just from reading part A and part B and also the seventh generation report. That will give you a complete picture in terms of why we made the recommendations that we did. Um, and then we went into a, a variety of, of recommendations around um, certain policies that police have in place, such as the use of force policy um, that has a lot of um, you know, different uh, provisions in it, like for instance, it has a provision that if there's a, a complaint around use of force uh, against the police, that that the police can wait up to four days to respond, um, and that if if a police if a police person takes up to four days to respond, that can already um, really impact um, how the complaint moves forward, right? So things like that, and and you know, and when you use use of force and those sort of things, and it's really the use of force is also very legalistic, so it is it's not even clear for people to understand, right? So making it very um, you know more clear and and understandable are some of the things that we talk about in our report, and we use this agency that um, are are uh, comprised of former law enforcement personnel to actually look at these policies and give us their recommendations in terms of what we ended up um, um, recommending, which was LEAP. Uh, and I forget the what, what it stood for, but I know it was these um, former law enforcement um, personnel that helped us look at these policies and helped us formulate our recommendations. Um, the other ones were, were around consent searches, really doing away with consent searches, because consent search is basically uh, when a police stops someone and says, oh, you give consent for me to search your vehicle or you, or you your person, or even, you know, if, they, if they're going to your home to search your home, a lot of times if you are in front of a police, you might feel intimidated, right? To say, yeah, search, right? Um, so one, you feel intimidated, so you might feel like you don't have a choice, but to say, yes, you can search. Two, you don't know the scope in terms of what they're going to search. You might be thinking that they're going to only search your pockets, but then they end up searching your whole body or they end up searching your whole vehicle. Um, you know, it, it, it just runs the gambit, right? So consent searches was something that we're saying that needs to, 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 to stop because it doesn't lead, lead to anything, you know, positive. And then in terms of like low level and protectural vehicle stops. So those are kind of like if, they're, if your tail light is out, or if your registration tags have expired, we are saying to, to stop those. Because we know as BIPOC people, a lot of times, um, you know, arrests or injuries can happen from vehicle stops. And unfortunately, there's, there, you know, two to one in terms of, of vehicle stops around BIPOC people versus white people, right, in, in, in Amherst. And so this, this was another reason to look at some of these things and really think about, vehicle stops happening only if there's real traffic safety violations occurring as opposed to a taillight um, being out, right? Um, 
And then just other like APD contract issues that we looked at, um, you know, for one of them was around, uh, you know, it, they had something like if it, if if um, a complaint is taking too long to look into, then you just dismiss it. So things like that, that we, we wanted those policies looked at so that it could be changed or updated. Um, and then we asked for a dashboard that was transparent with information around, um, you know, vehicle stops by race, and, and that hasn't occurred. I did hear that there's um, uh, a new platform that the police are trying to, to buy in order to publish their data, but still, you know, this was back in 2021 that we made these recommendations. So when 2024, why hasn't that happened? Okay. And then we made some, a lot of um, recommendations around traffic control. Uh, so one of them was move traffic control from the Amherst Police Department to a separate traffic control division on the Crest Department, leaving only jailable traffic offenses to the APD. Again, as we know, nationally and locally, um, traffic offenses, unfortunately, is one of the main ways that that BIPOC people, unfortunately, either get injured, and we know nationally is not even injured. Sometimes is it's, it's people get killed through traffic violations, right? And so um, one of the uh, recommendations we made was to create this unit that would be unarmed, that would be on the crest to also do uh, these traffic violations, unless there was some type of, you know, probable cause of, of serious reasonable um, suspicion that there was someone that either has a weapon or something like that, that the police would need to be involved in, right? So making those types of recommendations. Um, the other ones were informing drivers who have been stopped as to why they're being stopped, letting them know about their rights, letting them know that they can complain. I mean, simple things like that, that are not occurring right now. Um, you know, one was like a pilot confirmation of racial identification, which basically means, um, you know, a lot of times the data that the police include in terms of race and, and, and ethnicity is really only visual, right? Because of course you, you know, can't go around just saying, okay, what's your race or, or what have you. But we were thinking that possibly if you write up a script, could there be a pilot, a program to ask someone if, if, if someone is having an interaction with the police, you know, what their race is, right? If they want to volunteer that information so that there could be more accurate data. So that was something that we were exploring. And so we put that as a, a recommendation. And then lastly, um, pedestrian safety committee, because we all know, you know, pedestrian safety is one of the, you know, main things that, that we need to look at, especially around a place like Amherst, that's a college town, that there's a lot of cyclists, walkers, joggers. So creating a committee to kind of deal with pedestrian um, safety. And then um, the other two around uh, a racial healing and visioning, um, because we do know that there, there is a lot of mistrust. There is a lot of fear. There is a lot of anger, right, towards the police in terms of a lot of the interaction. We held two town meetings as well as surveys, as well as what Seventh Generation gathered. And we heard from the community that a lot of their interactions and, and were not good with the police. And so in order to move forward, there has to be some racial healing. There has to be a process to begin to, to build that trust. Um, and so we had recommended Barbara Love as, as the um, uh, facilitator for that because we had talked with, with Dr. Barbara Love um, during CSWG. And I think the town has engaged with her a little bit, but I'm not sure where things stand in terms of moving that forward. Because one of the things that we asked for is to make sure that there was translation services so that folks that usually won't be at these meetings were able to participate in these meetings and to make sure that you go out into the community and, and make sure that other voices take part in this visioning and healing uh, process and not just the same voices that we hear every time. Right. Um, and then, you know, a, a very important part, uh, last but not least, which is to develop an anti-racist department culture in Amherst Police Department. Right. Uh, a, a police department that is actually actively um, anti-racist. Uh, and I have this was one of the things that we put in the report. So actively anti-racist 
means taking initiative to eliminate white domination and seeking to understand more deeply how to contemporary racism operates and affects people, right? So you're looking at that in every facet of your organization in every facet of your decision-making and your hiring policies and procedures. And you're thinking about that in terms of how you interact with people. And when you make mistakes, you, you are able to hold yourself accountable, right? Not to just say, well, actually I didn't do that, but to hold yourself accountable and to really be out there saying that you're anti-racist, not to say that, you know, I'm colorblind or I'm non-racist. It's really to be anti-racist, be proactively anti-racist, right? And th this is something that the, the, the Amherst Police Department and other officers in, in Amherst, they need the assistance with, because I haven't heard anything about that in regard and since we we made these recommendations and any steps forward in terms of of, of taking those um further steps for APD to be anti-racist so I'll stop there um so I'm going to talk a little about the community safety and social justice committee which took over the work from CSWG in 2022 our role is to incorporate and continue the work done by CSWG for systemic change. So part of that is ensuring that all of the recommendations from CSWG are, and that were adopted by town council or the town manager are implemented and tracking their progress, including the CREST department, the DEI department, the Youth Empowerment Center and the BIPOC Multicultural Center. Um, so we do meet once a month and Jennifer Moyston, who's the assistant director of DEI is our staff liaison, but Pamela Young also joins our meetings to give updates about how the DEI department has been moving. And um, up until August, Earl Miller, who was the former director of CRESS had been joining our meetings. And now Pamela also gives us updates about the CRESS department. Um, Deborah and I have also had the opportunity to tour the Crest Department and speak with some of the responders um, since the transition has taken place. And um, I am currently serving on the Crest Director Search Committee. So that is a way that CSSJC has been incorporated by the town in a way to move things forward. Um, Supporting the work of the DEI and CREST programs and employees that address the needs of BIPOC and other marginalized groups, including the disabled immigrants and LGBTQIA individuals. Um, and some of that has looked like showing up at some of the events that they've had. Um, most recently this week, they had the MLK reading on Monday and they were supposed to have the racial healing um, event at Crocker Farm. If it did go on during the storm, I was unable to attend due to <laughs> road conditions, but um, they have had successful events as well um, with different BIPOC groups in the community. Um, assisting the town and exploring research resources for buildings for the Youth Empowerment Center and BIPOC Multicultural Center. Um, I would say we've given a few ideas based on some available real estate in town. Nothing has sunk in yet for a location. Um, I believe that they are using an AmeriCorps volunteer to work on programming for now, but we have continued to highlight the need for an actual space for youth to be able to go um, where they can feel safe and they have some agency over what happens there. Um, recommending funding sources, including grants and focused on targeted priorities for marginalized residents with the most impactful and sustainable projects. Providing input to the town manager during the budget process. This for us has looked like sending a letter to the town manager, including the original budgets from um, the CSWG showing where the shortfalls are in terms of how we are not at the staffing le levels that were initially recommended and um, then projecting that into the current year's fiscal dollars so that we can have an understanding of what the budget should look like. Um, and lastly, ensuring the town implements a robust translation service. This has also been slow moving. The CSSJC 
has been able to offer a few of our own um, forums with translation services. So we did host two forums in November and December. One was online and one was in person. We did have translation in Portuguese, Spanish, and Mandarin. Um, we were unable to track how many people online were using the services, um, but they were available and that's something that we hope to continue to be able to offer. Um, we did partner with the UMass Translation Service for that, those two events, um, and hopefully that will be a partnership that can continue with the town. I do want to mention that back in June of 2023, CSSJC, along with the Board of Health, um, the Amherst House, uh, Municipal Housing Trust, and the Human Rights Commission did co-sponsor a community forum on affordable housing in town and did offer translation services in the same language. So you know, there are other groups out in the community trying to offer more accessible meetings. Um, and that's something that we want to continue to provide for the community. Um, so currently our membership is myself and Deborah as the co-chairs. And when the committee was originally formed, it specified in the charge that two of the initial members had to be from the CSWG. So Deborah was one of the CSWG members. Ms. Pat Onanibaku was the other original CSWG member who sat on CSSJC. She did resign her seat last year. Um, and so we do have three new members, Everald Henry, who is an attorney in town, Isabella Malmquist, who is a student at Amherst College, who is um, very interested in human rights and social justice, and Lisette Paredes, who works in the clerk's office in the Springfield Court. Um, previously, we also had Philip Avila, who sadly left town um, for California, but he was previously employed at the Amherst Survival Center. Dr. Freca Ete, who is now a district counselor in District 1 for the town council. Miss Pat, and then Dr. Demetria Shabazz, uh, who was the original co-chair and brought a wealth of knowledge from her work, both in the community and as um, the leader of the Seven Gen Movement Collective, who had done a lot of the consulting work for the CSWG. Uh, so that is our membership. We do have two vacancies currently. One is set aside for a youth member. So we are hoping that a, a high school student would be able to fill that member um, slot and then a general membership opportunity as well. Um, so we're gonna get a little more into the CRESS program. Um, so from the website, the Community Responders for Equity, Safety and Service is an unarmed person-centered trauma-informed anti-racist public safety energy agency, which I think captures a lot of what we want Crest to be. And um, then the rest of the information on the slide was taken from the actual CSWG report when it conceptualized CS, uh, the Crest department. So I don't know if Deborah wants to go over that. Well, I mean, I think I already went, um, you know, a little bit into that when I was talking about Crest uh, beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, obviously, um, you know, Chris would be first responders to all situations that don't involve violence or serious criminal activity, including mental health issues, homelessness, substance abuse, trespass, truancy, wellness checks, youth in school and schools, but also like um noise complaints, um, any type of like the you know, um disorderly that does include a violence, anything like that, we conceptualize it to be CRESS, who would be the the, the um, agency, public service agency, public safety agency to respond. Um, and, and that's something that we really want to kind of focus on because, you know, as CRESS has been formulated, you know, first by Earl Miller, and now with, with this temporary leadership team, and, and to, to be clear right now, the temporary leadership team is Pamela Young, who is the lead for it. And then we have um, a sergeant from the um, UMA, I mean, the Amherst Police Department. Then we have Fire Chief Nelson from the Fire Department. And then we have um, uh, Kat Newman, who was the 
she's kind of like the I guess second in command maybe um, within within Crest, and she's um, part of this this leadership team. Um, and you know, and for the the recommendation and the vision, and when we researched um, community responders, we were very clear in terms of CSWG and the recommendations that um, Crest is to be independent and autonomous from the police department. Yes, you work with the police department as all other safety um, agencies do, right? Fire department works with the police department, works with the EMTs, and so on and so forth. But they shouldn't be. Um, um, you know, there shouldn't be any supervision of the program. And so that's already changed, right? O over this, this this past year and now with this transition. Um, so it's very concerning right now in terms of what is going to um, happen with Crest because there's a search now for a new Crest director and what message is gonna be sent to the Crest director. Also the fact that Earl Miller um, was put on paid administrative leave and then he was disciplined and because it was a personnel matter, we don't know what was the reasons for, for him leaving. He was a black leader, a black man. So what message is sent to any leader that goes into crest, right? Um, it, it, you know, because we don't even know why Earl Miller was dismissed or anything like that. And so it sends a message uh, around this 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 uh, program, this department, which is is very concerning, right? Um, but we need to make sure that Crest is solidified, that it's strengthened, and it continues forward because we we have been hearing a lot of wonderful feedback in terms of Crest going into situations, de-escalating situations, making people feel comfortable but also understanding that Crest is not a, um, a, a public service you know, agency, a social service agency. Yes, it has so, uh, social service aspects to it in terms of the connection and making sure that you're building those relationships, but it is a first responder and then it's a liaison to connect to other resources so that that person can get the help that they need. But there's been a lot of like throughout this past year, just Cress being the A to Z person and taking care of all of the um, steps that that person might need in terms of the concerns. And so then it changes the mission and the vision of Cress in terms of it. Is it a public safety department or is it something else? And the focus in terms of our charge as CSWG was to create a department that's public safety focused, right? And so that's something that we want to keep in mind. And that's something that we want to, you know, be very uh, careful and monitor very closely. Um, so currently, Cress is housed in the Bang Center. It's on the second floor. And it does have its own phone number. So if you are experiencing some sort of crisis and don't want to call the police, you can call Crest directly. Um, and their hours of operation are Monday through Friday, eight to four and Saturday, 10 to six. It's my understanding that these are represent a reduction in the hours that they were originally operating from due to the fact that after um, around the time that the first director left or was placed on leave, three of the responders also left. Um, I believe that those three positions have been filled. Um, so I do believe that Cress will have a staff of eight for the new director when that person is identified and starts. And the hope is that their hours will expand again Unfortunately, there has been some logistical difficulty that they've identified with Crest being housed at the Bang Center. The Bang Center is not a 24-hour operational building, so they have said that Crest cannot be operating out of the Bang Center 24-7. Um, it's my understanding, again, that they have now procured office space in the library. So they are operating out of the library at some times. Um, and from what we have been told in our CSSJC meeting, 
there has been a reduction in police calls to the library with Cress having a presence there, um, which I think could be a positive sign that kind of what CSWG had envisioned having Cress respond instead of police will reduce the need for police to respond in certain situations. Um, I don't I don't have a full understanding of what kinds of calls they're responding to at the department, though I imagine that some of it has to do with some of the unhoused population who uses parts of the library um, from some of the other service providers in town who have been more in contact with Cress on a regular basis. Um, again, the the proposed staffing plan from the CSWG included at least 12 responders and a level of supervisors that there are no supervisors. So there's no intermediary management built into the current structure, which I believe has a lot to do with why we have an interim leadership team instead of somebody from Cress as the person in charge during the leadership vacancy. So there's the hope would be that an assistant directorship becomes part of the leadership structure for Cress and that that would also allow some of the hours to expand moving towards being operational 24/7. Yeah, and I want to and I want to add to that because that's critical. Um, you know what Allegra just stated in terms of the recommendations that CSWG made that we made, which was to have sufficient staff, supervisors, director, uh, in place so that this this operation could be twenty four seven. As we know, a lot of crisis, a lot of what happens happens overnight. And during the kind of, you know, dawn hours or even midnight hours, one, two o'clock in the morning. And now look at look at how Crest is running, right? Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, you know, this this uh, create, uh, uh, brings up a lot of um, issues in regards to that and the fact that it wasn't sufficiently funded off right right when it was originated because there was no intermediary, no assistant director, no other supervisor. And now that's why Crest is in the place that it's in right now in terms of it being in this precarious situation where it has this leadership team where there's the police and the fire chief on it and they don't have anyone that's dedicated. So it's going to be critical to be able to hire intermediary uh, supervision. So it can't be just the director. So once the director is hired, the director is going to need to hire uh, uh, an assistant director or some type of shift supervisor or supervisors as what we had recommended so that a uh, crest can, can, can uh, continue on uh, smoothly. Again, these are things that we had recommended. Why weren't they put in place? And that's why there's a lot of mistrust with the town, right? And I, I'm, I'm some of that I'm going to talk clear. Right. I, I'm, I do not like to mince words in regards to it. So if you don't if you don't sufficiently staff a department, then this is what happens when when situations take place, because, yes, a director can end up leaving, even though uh, the crest director left under suspicious circumstances, because we don't even know why he left. But it's just like so that's one. Right. And two, there was no number two to be able to take over in terms of Crest. So it really gives me pause as to it, does the town truly want um, Crest to be successful or not? And th those are some of the things that we need to think about. And those are some of the things that we need to really um, look at and start advocating for. Because these hours and the number of responders that are in place are not going to be able to do all the work that needs to be done. And uh, what Allegra is stating that they're in the library, that's well and good. And I'm happy to hear that they're being able to be a, to assist. But there's a lot of, uh, of people, especially BIPOC people, that do not feel comfortable going to the library because the library is not an inclusive place for, for those of different identities. So that's something, too, that you need to think about, right? So you're already in a place like bank that's not 24-7. And now they're also in a place like library that a lot of people don't feel it's a safe space for them to go. And I know there's a question, but let's just finish. We have one more slide and then we'll, we'll answer questions after this next slide. So lastly, um, 
December 18th, certain 911 calls have been dispatched to Cress instead of the Amherst Police Department. Um, they are starting with a small list and hoping to expand, but the current list includes well-being checks, mental health calls, assisting business or agency, and assisting citizen. So for example, if somebody has perhaps is a regular who attends the senior center who hasn't shown up for a few days, Crest could be dispatched to go visit their home to see if everything is okay, to make sure nothing happened, um, or for assisting a business or agency. For example, I believe the library would fit into that. Um, also agencies like Craig's Doors, the, the shelter, and the Amherst Survival Center, they are being dispatched to calls that take place there as well. Um, and I've heard an anecdote that there was an incident at the survival center where someone was starting to escalate and Cress was able to offer the person a ride home. And so the scenario didn't turn into something that the police might have been called for if there had been a physical altercation involved. Um, so that and and just to add to that, I mean, obviously, um, I'm I'm glad to hear that finally, Crest is finally getting um, some dispatch calls made because this was something that we wanted to have happen uh, months ago. Um, actually, when Earl Miller was put on leave, um, that was one of the things that he was really pushing for was for um, calls to be dispatched, um, and actually, he had stated that that he wanted calls to start being dispatched in August. And then in August, he was put in paid administrative leave. Now, whether that has anything to do with it, I don't know, but it's it's very curious, right? I question, I question that, right? Um, and so now, you know, a couple of months later, there's some, some you know, um, calls being dispatched, which I'm glad to hear because basically, Crest for many months wasn't doing what it was supposed to do, which is, be a public safety. So that's a, a big reason why responders would leave, right? Not only because the, 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 the director is no longer there, there's no longer any leadership, but also there wasn't enough to do because they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing, which was being a public safety agency. So if you're being dispatched calls, at least now you could start being a public safety uh, uh, agency and actually dealing with what it was that you were hired to do. Now they're starting with very small um, number of, of of dispatch calls, which is something that you know I questioned. I know I questioned CSSJC members questioned, um, and in our last meeting to this temporary leadership team and asking why is it that that more calls are being dispatched uh, to Cress since they have been um, you know working over a year. Um, and being able to deal with these uh, types of situations. So we're, we're going to be monitoring that very closely because you know they have to do the work that they were hired to, to do as opposed to them um, you know, being utilized in other capacities. Like there was a lot of data that they were being utilized as you know, just to transport people um, to different places. That's not why Crest was created. Crest wasn't created as a transport department. Um, you know, yes, you can transport people some of the time, but that shouldn't be your main, um, you know, uh, um, responsibility. So these are some of the things that we wanted to make sure to share during this presentation so that people are aware about because information, knowledge, that's one of the main things that, that an informed a constituency needs to know in order to make ch changes, in order to be aware of what's happening so that they can ask for these changes to occur. So um, thank you for your time and you know, and any questions that- Thank you so have, much. Yes, like that you. was wonderful. Oh, I feel, I felt like I knew things more than, than I do now, you know, anyway. Um, people, if you have questions, see if you can find the hand thing. I see Martha has her hand up. So why don't we start with Martha okay. and unmute, okay. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I, I really think, you know, everybody in town should listen to this because you really gave a very thorough uh, description of both of, uh, of the previous CSWG and their recommendations and so on. But I did want to say that I attended the, the Cup of Joe uh, 
what it was a week and a half ago, where uh, there was a discussion of crafts. And so it was Tim Nelson who was there and uh, Sergeant Griffin from the police department were the two from the interim team who were there along with Paul Bachelman. And there were maybe, oh, a dozen people in the audience for, for different reasons, not all coming for, for crafts. But I was, must say, I was very impressed with the sincerity of both Paul and Tim and Sergeant Griffin. I really felt that they want very much for Crest to succeed and that they're very uh, enthusiastic about it. I mean, we all have to admit that they're, you know, everybody's marking time ever since Earl left until we get a new director. But I was, I, as I say, I was imp impressed by that. And I, and I know that Paul just felt so badly when Earl left for, you know, whatever the reasons were, because, you know, he, I think, really, really wants this program to uh, succeed. I also was interested to hear, you know, I asked about the, the fact that Cress was just working the daylight hours when, you know, we had all uh, anticipated that we wanted a 24-hour coverage and so on. And the answer that was given, and both uh, all three of the of them were shared this concern that they were very concerned about protecting the crest responders and making sure that no one was harmed by some an incident that turned violent, and that that's why they were proceeding cautiously. And that's at least my was my interpretation. And Sergeant Griffin specifically said that statistically it's after 10 p.m. that the calls and the incidents and so on get more violent. And so, you know, my thought is, gee, maybe we should be asking them that as soon as possible when the director is on board and gets his or her feet in the ground, uh, that maybe we could ask for that second shift you no, know, four to ten p.m. as as the next step, um, but that was that was kind of an eye opener for me uh, that that seemed to be one of the main reasons they wanted to proceed cautiously, and that that was the main reason for starting with these small tasks. You know, now uh, with the dispatch calls, plus the fact that they don't have the leadership yet, um, so. And then the other question I wanted to ask is about the Youth Empowerment Center. Uh, do do you two and your or your committee have any specific recommendations of places that could be used in town? Um, there was some. Like, do you remember some of the places that we had talked about? So I think some of the places that were kind of deemed not not great options or, or things, places where other things were happening. One was the space where Hastings used to be, um, since that's central, but there was already obviously a plan for that place that mm -hmm. didn't involve um, youth. And I think there had been some talk with Amherst College about possibly using some space on campus, but a Again, there were questions around whether that would feel like a space that the youth could have ownership over and whether it would be adequate um, space. And there was, again, I think, I think there was talk around, I think, St. Saint, Saint Bridget's um, Parish Hall. And there were, there was some question around whether youth who might not identify with that religion would feel comfortable in that space, um, even if it was not presented as a religious space. Um, some, I mean, there are some, obviously the Wildwood School will be coming on, you know, off of the school property inventory whenever the new school is built. And that has been floated as an idea for a space for many different needs in town um, or possibly a multi-generational gathering space. Um, I think one of the big 
issues is finding a place that's accessible for people who don't have cars. So something that would be on a bus route where kids could maybe even walk from the high school or middle school. Um, so that does obviously limit <laughs> limit the possibilities. Um, yeah, and, and I think that with some of that is, is really having a budget because right now they don't even have a budget to be able to, um, when you're thinking about location and like like we said that that's you know transportation or walking, it is first they they need to establish a budget right that would include being able to to have a space and to maintain a space and to be able to have programming there and things like that and you know and that hasn't even happened so so I think we need to you know even though we've we've had conversations around spaces but you know you need to have budget first and foremost. Um, and and Martha, in terms of your other statements, I, I do hope, I mean, you know, I do hope that the town is, um, you know, wholeheartedly wanting um, Crest to be successful, um, because obviously CSSJC, we're committed to Crest being successful, and we're going to continue to ask the questions and making sure to bring up um, what needs to be brought up to um, um, make sure that Crest continues uh, with the budget, with making sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, because we don't want to lose more responders. So there has to be a balance, you know. Um, I, I know about being protective, but you can't be so protective that then you're losing responders because they're not doing the job that they were hired to do. Well, Deborah, I think also, um, <laughs> I don't see why uh, we don't think about looking at places where Crest is, has been successful and ask them what they do. Because I don't really think that Amherst has reached out very much. I don't mean your group. I'm talking about the town. And I mentioned it years, you know, when it was first started. I said, can we look at the other Crest programs, which most of them are very successful. And most police departments are very happy that they are there. Because mm -hmm. they have eliminated so many unnecessary things that police end up having more time to do the things that they have to do. And they're less you know, whatever, but I'm saying there are other cities in the United States that have Crest programs yeah, and we they, it's successful. So why don't we find out? Are yeah. they more dangerous in the, at night? What do you do? I mean, there are ways to do this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's your job. I'm saying, but that's something that administration could look at once the person gets in a position. And they do what other people do. Tim, Tim Nelson did describe that and said they're getting a grant mm -hmm. to, and they've been in, had interactions with Durham, North Carolina, and they're getting a grant to actually have some members go down there and spend time and talk with them. They say that they think that that is a particularly good program that could be a parallel for Amherst. Well, I think there's more than one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I'm just saying, yeah, but but this, but the um, idea um, came from the successful ones. There's more right. than one. So and I, I, I do say, believe, yeah. I was going to say, I do believe that grant involved more than one I believe they also might be visiting either Denver or Oregon or both yeah. um, as part of that as well so that they yeah. are I know there's several there's several spots and I and they've been successful so we can ask them and and to be truthful as someone who has driven home from way away from here uh, not only do you not have lights which of course is my biggest objection to Amherst and the area uh, but there is almost no people. So, you know, I'm just saying, I'm not saying that people don't create problems at, late at night. I do understand, but um, I think they could find out from other areas as to what they do and how they handle it. Um, Ash, you have a question. I'm sorry. Un unmute. Ash, unmute. Time is very short, so I'll make this very brief. But right now, um, these two key um positions, the new director for, for Cress and the new police chief are, and, and it's so critical that those choices are, are made well. And I have one critical question about the police chief, and I don't know if anybody here can answer it, David, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, in, the, in the interviews and in the, in the search, what is the view of potential applicants for the police chief in relation to Cress? seems to me that that relationship is absolutely critical. And uh, and I'm just wondering if there's anything positive that is coming out of the possible applicants that, that suggests ways of actually doing the things that the CSWG report 
um, has made so clear need to be done and which reflect the town's uh, resolution. Well, um, just to, I can just speak on my end and then Alaro, I know you probably have more to add, but I know that there was a consultant that was hired uh, by the town to, to look at and meet with you know different groups and met with CSSJC and also members of CSWG in terms of what, what are some of the attributes and values and so on and so forth that looking into, uh, you know, for a new police chief. And obviously we talked about that, right? In terms of the relationship with Cress and in terms of the CSWG recommendations, in terms of being, you know, an anti-racist department and all of that, right? And yeah. also we do have um, a CSSJC member on the, uh, the search committee for the police chief, which is Everald. Um, so he's on there. And so of course, Everald is gonna center um, that that very <laughs> discussion and that very point in terms of with with these different candidates. So so just to let you know, and, and David, David, our our person from Racial Justice Committee is on that on that uh, committee also. So okay, great, yeah, that's, that's good. Sorry, David, I just had to out you there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and I guess else? my addition to that would be during our. Um, our CRESS forums that we held as CSSJC, we did hear some feedback as well about what community members were hoping to see in a police chief um, and you know how they can work with CRESS without working over CRESS, I guess. Um, so hopefully Everold will be relaying that information back as well. Is anybody else? have questions i mean you all were so thorough it's <laughs> and when do you when do when do you meet because the the meetings are open and they're on zoom um you meet on wednesdays is we do. so usually we're meeting the second wednesday of the month i believe for february we will meet the first wednesday which is february 7th um usually 6 30 to about 9 30 um and there was one other thing. Well, just to say the reason why we're meeting on the first um, Tuesday this time around is just that obviously second Tuesday would have been on February 14th. We know a lot of people might have things that they're doing. So we didn't want to obviously have people choose between going, doing their Valentine's Day events or going to our meeting. And so that's why uh, we, we changed it to February 7th at 6.30. And they are open, you know, you can go to our uh, webpage or the town uh, website and you can get the Zoom link so that you can, um, you know, participate. And we have a public comment in the beginning and then a public comment at the end. And then you can listen in on all our discussions. And we, we try to obviously always uh, bring a wealth of information in regards to all of the, you know, different issues that we're talking about, recommendations, as well as CRESS uh, is one of the main topics because usually Pamela's there to um, share an update, but also Chief Nelson and um, Sergeant Griffin. Um, Kat Newman hasn't been able to attend, but, but, but Sergeant Griffin has attended before. So we always have a very uh, spirited conversations with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, if if uh, I'm gonna um, um, explain at the end of this, when you leave, please don't just leave. Go. There's a questionnaire. We it's a simple one. It takes three minutes, but please fill it out because we have to give uh, information to our uh, uh, national and state league, and it's very helpful. Is uh, you know, thank you all for giving your time and and coming to listen to these wonderful people. Who are doing such hard work? I have been to some of their meetings, and it's a lot of stuff. So, congratulations! I really, we will, we'll be talking to you again. I know, as time goes on, and I wish you, you all, and everything you do. I really wish you a lot of uh, good luck and list people listening and hearing what you have to say, etc. Uh, as we, most of us did for the uh, CSWG, and you know. It came out well, so now it's there's somebody that's giving it more credence and more opportunity. And we are definitely looking at the uh, resident oversight board. We are very much concerned about that also. So let us know if we need to write a letter. Yes, <laughs> <please do. laughs> we'll definitely, yeah, invite us back to your meetings. We'll definitely have uh, plenty of uh, to-dos because, yeah, it has to be a partnership with, with sure. you. 
and Absolutely. all these different like human rights commission and the folks that want reparations and everyone we all need to do this absolutely because we're asking that question too <laughs> that's one of the things on our agenda right 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 racial justice committee is uh what's happening with reparations you know so that's one of the you know because you you have to keep asking you have to keep being involved or else you know nothing but that's what the league is about, is about justice and people being able to vote and people at knowing, being informed about what's going on in their community. So I thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate it. <laughs> anyway, anybody have any more questions? Because otherwise, just don't forget to do the survey. <laughs>